So um, I'm going to talk about train wheels. What do uh, future ED docs or what do ED docs need to know? And as you can tell from this conference, medicine is changing. All right. It is. You know, so when I started training in 1982, I remember this. I, you know, like the first day I'm talking to Doc, goes, oh, I wish, I'm, you know, medicine's changing so much, I can't wait to get out. I would never have my kid go into medicine. This was 1982, okay? Medicine changes, all right? That's a given. It's probably changing at a faster pace than it ever has, you know, with all the consolidations, all, you know, all the things that's happening in medicine. You got two choices. You can complain about it. You can complain about our you know, uh, patient experience uh, and say it's not fair or you can work to change it. And so I'm always of the, I'm going to work to change it kind of a mode set. So I'm going to talk about some of the things that are going on, what are some of the impotence uh, for, uh, for changing. So the Macy Conference, jo Josiah Macy Conference had the, uh, funded the Institute of Medicine to look at graduate medical education. This uh, recommendations came out in 2011, and they were enhanced in 2016. And basically, he said there's challenged graduate medical education is challenged at many levels in the United States. We're not adequately preparing physicians for their future practice. And again, the future practice is going to be way different than it was 10 years ago. It's going to be different than it is now. And we're not uh, being sufficiently responsive to the needs of society. So we'll talk about some of these, these points. Broader reforms are needed. Uh, there's changing patient demographics. We saw that in Jim Augustine's, you know, we're seeing less, uh, you know, four, 18 and under patients. As uh, I remember Greg Henry always said, you know, pediatrics is just one immunization away from losing, bec not becoming a specialty anymore. So, um, and there's some, some truth to that in, in some ways, but the, the population is aging. And uh, so we have to look at how we're going to deal with an aging population, which may have more health care and usually does have more health care needs. Um, there's evolution of health care delivery. There's, you know, people are, are still more concentrated in the cities, but how do we take care of patients out in rural areas? We need to use uh, health care technologies more efficiently. You know, I think a lot of people say we're still at the beta stage for um, EMR use. They're not really working for you. Uh, you're still working for your EMR, most of us. So I think that's going to change over time. And demand for a more efficient, cost-effective healthcare system. So they called for five major uh, reforms. Uh, greater accountability through public representation and public reporting. We're starting to see that more greater re relevance through broadening sites and content of training requiring interprofessional education. So now we're working as teams. We've got to start training in a more interprofessional way how to work as a team, how to work with APPs. I don't think we really, none of us got any training in how to work in a team. You know, there, we might have done some team steps. Certainly when I was uh, training, you know, you just, work with nursing. Now you have to work with APPs and other healthcare providers. We don't really have the training or give training for that. Um, greater efficiency through adopting a competency-based approach. So all the specialties now have gone to a competency-based approach and you have to attain milestones. And so that's been a, a big process, that emergency medicine. And then eliminating non-educational experiences and redundancies. Greater flexibility to individualize training for different career goals. I think ultimately we're going to see medical school shorten to three years in a lot of instances. You may see, I don't know if you'll see residencies shortened much, um, but I think you will definitely see medical school. And a lot of that's due to the average debt of a student's almost, you know, $250,000, $280,000. Um, most of them don't do much in that fourth year. So I think we're going to start seeing some flexibility in training uh, and then having a greater research base to improve and evaluate our training. So what are the educational areas focused for in emergency medicine? Well, they asked... Uh, I mean, so there's a lot of different areas, and we've talked about a lot of these during our, our sessions over the last uh, day and a half. Risk-based medicine, you know, we have to start focusing on that, how we're going to be involved in that. Quality, we've already talked about that. Patient safety, the customer service, uh, and care coordination. 
Um, you know, most of you 10 years ago, for, for some of you, some of the older people in the room, or more seasoned people in the room, I should say, <laughs> more experienced people, um, you know, we didn't have to deal with this stuff, you know. Uh, care coordination, you know, not to a great extent. Yeah, you had a little customer service. There's definitely some quality, but risk-based uh, medicine um, wasn't around. So, but this is the new era that we're moving into. Um, and a lot of it's due to cost. Um, you know, we're approaching 19% of our gross domestic product is healthcare. Um, that may or may not be right. Most economists say that's too much. Um, we certainly lead the, the, the world in, in spending in health care. And so we're going to have to find ways to reduce costs in an in a, um, effective way that uh, still will enhance quality, patient safety, customer service. Uh, and finance is going to become more important. You're going to have to understand what risk-based medicine is, what the risk-based models are. I think we're going to have to have a, you know, the whole medical finance uh, business is going to have to be trained for, we're going to have to train our, our, our future docs on this aspect. So they asked uh, CEOs what are the most important for physicians to possess in order to successfully practice medicine in the future. So again, these were CEOs. But number one was interpersonal communication skills. Now we had some of that in medicine, but probably not uh, as much. Uh, we've had some talks here on that. Uh, but I think doctors, uh, you know, that's going to be the number one aspect. How to, how to work with other uh, health care providers is something we don't really train on. And we work in teams now, so we're going to have to develop that. Using uh, health informatic technology and EHRs to improve tools to improve patient care. Uh, managerial expertise, so leadership. Uh, stra strategic planning, uh, financial management are things that, again, our, our CEOs feel that physicians need to have. Most of us got very little of that in medical school or even in residency. You maybe got some more in residency. Again, going to conferences like this, I think, will help develop some of that managerial expertise. Some of the things I talked about yesterday in my leadership lecture, there's a lot of different organizations that can help prepare you for that. And then value-based care expertise. So those are the top four. But again, future healthcare trends, hospital CEOs report uh, needing more innovative leaders and clinicians, as well as employees with technology and data analytic skills. Increasingly, consumers expect to partner with doctors instead of relying on passively on them to make treatment decisions. I mean, thank God for Google, right? I mean, otherwise, you know, they wouldn't know what they had when they came in. Um, but, you know, they do come in. How many, I mean, you know, probably all of us, they show you the Google and they think they, you know, got, you know, Kawasaki's disease or something. And, uh, but more and more as, you know, as their medical records become more transparent, as they become more educated, they're going to want to partner with doctors um, and, and hospitals in their healthcare decisions, especially as you know, we go to higher deductible, you know, insurance. How many of you, you know, you're fighting with a patient over getting a CT now or, or lab work um, because, you know, they're getting stuck with the bills? Uh, that didn't happen 10 years ago, but now they're more engaged and part of it's financial on their part. Um, so... Physicians uh, report, uh, you know, 50% of their compensation in the future will be paid through value-based payment models. Um, and expect to need new business, health informatic technology, and communication skills to practice effectively in a value-based care. Because value-based care is going to require care coordination. It's going to require communication sort of up front. As an emergency physician, you're probably going to have to start communicating up front more um, with patients that are in risk-based models. We, you know, we have to, you know, if they've had a uh, cardiac procedure now within 30 days, of course, yesterday they just extended to 90 days now, we have to call first um, when they come in from, our, you know, from our SUMA health plan. Um, and, but expect other 
larger groups, if you have private groups, and they're going to be on risk-based, primary care groups are going to be on risk-based contracts. They're going to want more coordination and more say, because every dollar they spend in an emergency department comes out of their risk-based model. So we're going to have to learn how to work with that in the future. Um, and you know, particularly in care coordination, which I'll talk about in a minute. So having business acumen is going to be skills that are going to be needed. And, and business acumen is under a basic understanding of finance, but also in these risk-based models, what happens in a risk-based model? Where does the funds flow? Uh, how does that affect your care? Um, I think there's going to be a lot more analytics on how we uh, follow practice guidelines. I think, you know, there's already programs out there, Crimson and others have uh, programs out there that look at see how primary care doctors follow CHF protocols or COPD protocols or diabetes protocols. I, this will also start, you know, going into the emergency department. So you have to have a financial understanding. How many of you get measured on your CT utilization or other utilization? Because we measure our docs now on CT utilization. Um, and probably we're going to start MRI utilization as well. Um, so using effective data analytic and HI uh, health informatic uh, tools are going to be important. And again, enhanced communication and leadership skills um, and how we fit into an overall care coordination and risk-based model is going to be critical for the future. So healthcare, I'm just going to go over this briefly. The, the current system is evolving. But it used to be, you know, you, get, you still get paid on relative value units, okay? That's going to be changing, all right? You know, the new system's going to be value-based. And, you know, value equals quality divided by cost plus service excellence. So all of those, you know, quality, excellence, and cost are going to be factored into value. Um, hospitals are now getting paid for quality. They're getting paid on, you know, reducing costs in terms of readmissions. Um, and they're getting, going to get paid on service excellence. So if you're, you know, have a contract with the hospital, they're going to want you to start focusing on this because they're, the hospital is now at more risk. Um, they either will get money from CMS or they're going to have to pay money for, to CMS based on some of these metrics now. Uh, and the new metrics, quality, you know, quality, how's that defined? You know, there's a lot of different organizations, National Quality Foundation, Physician Quality Reporting System, CMS, um, the ASEP uh, CEDAR may be an, an area opportunity, our clinical emergency department registry for measuring quality. Patient safety is going to be a new metric, readmissions, and then cost. Costs going to be episodes of care, ACOs, bundle payments, maybe even again following guidelines, whether it's choosing wisely or other guidelines, nexus guidelines, other things that are out there. We're going to be getting measured that in the future. In fact, m some of us already are. So, you know, we're moving from a transactional model um, where, from a, you know, you get paid per transition. Um, and we're going to be moving, you know, we've moved to episodic care. So you're starting to see some bundled payments. We're going to start moving into condition care models, which is going to be, you know, based on a disease. And, and again, oncology has already moved into that, to a population care model. Um, and uh, we're going to be responsible or we'll be part of a risk-based approach or population care model. We will have to pay, uh, be part of that model. We're going to have to participate. Now, whether we get paid in that, but I guarantee we're going to have to participate with our primary care doctors and our specialists who are going to be in a population care model. So we're going to have to start following guidelines more. We're going to have to start communicating better up front when their patients come in. I don't think we've seen that to the extent yet, but this is coming. I mean, most, I, mean, I guarantee you, almost all your primary care groups out there are on some sort of risk-based model right now. Maybe it's a small percentage, but that will grow over time. And again, there's many value-based contracting models out there. You know, this is, collaboration is on uh, the, um, the y-axis and the x-axis is, is risk managed by providers. Um, so ACOs is probably the biggest, and, and you know, we've had various 
formations of ACOs over the last few decades. But I think we've learned from that, and I think, again, we're going to be in a risk-based model looking at patient population. Bundle payments is up there. And then you can look at all the different, at, different models that are out there in terms of value-based contracting, how they can influence the cost. And, and make no doubt about it, it is about reducing costs. Yes, it's in, about improving care, it's about improving quality, it's about improving patient experience, but make no doubt about it, it's about reducing cost overall. So, you know, you've got the merit-based incentive payment uh, programs, you've got alternative payment models. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You know, Trump yesterday said he's going to get rid of all this, the, uh, the Accountable Care Act. But whether we still have MIPS and APM, which we still do and, and we still may in the future, the things underneath there, um, what the new system, meaningful use of EHR, resource use, quality, clinical practice improvement, bundles, they're all going to stay in, in whatever format or you know, whatever the new health care is going to look like, these are still going to be the components. You know, whether the payment you know, changes, um, it may, it may not, but that's what, what we're going to have. So in, in the clinical practice improvement activities, they're going to look at expanded practice access. Any of your uh, primary, I like to see primary care groups have expanded their um, after hours clinics or weekend clinics. I mean, you know, I have two really big primary care groups that are outside of SUMA, and they've both done that because, uh, you know, they're in risk-based contracts. They'd rather take care of the patients themselves. So, you know, we're looking at new models. Could we have, like, a freestanding ED urgent care model? What is the price point to look at when they should come to our urgent care versus keeping their, their clinics open on weekends? But, again, expanded practice is, is an important component. Population management, which is managing the health conditions and providing timely intervention. It's basically keeping people well. Uh, care coordination, uh, beneficiary engagement, uh, working with patients, having access to their medical records, having uh, you know, input into their health care is what's going to happen in the future. And it's actually happening right now because this is, you know, MIPS is, a lot of us are still getting paid now on, on MIPS. Um, so, and then advancing care, there's a lot of different electronic prescribing, you know. Did everybody have electronic prescribing yet? Who doesn't have electronic prescribing? Because we, we don't have it yet. Everybody's got from your ED? You know, I guess we're behind the times. Uh, I mean, we, you know, we print them out, but we don't have them going to the electronic. But that's, that's definitely coming, and you have to do it in order to get paid now in the future. Um, patient electronic access, uh, all these things, health information uh, exchange, monitoring patients, are all going to be part of the, the, the future of advancing you know, care information. So what is the academic response to this? Well, you know... For GME funding, hospitals that have practice plans are going to have to align their clinical goals. There is definitely a movement away from academics. And, you know, the ACGME for emergency medicine just are taking away the, the pro proscribed protected hours for emergency medicine core faculty. Before, you could only work 112 hours, well, you know, as a core faculty. Well, th those proscribed hours are gone now. Um, it says they still have to have protected time, but it's not prescribed. Emergency medicine was different than everybody else, and the ACGME wants all their common program requirements to be similar. So, you know, there's a, a movement towards greater clinical productivity. Uh, we have to look at that. So how do we, what are the clinical challenges? You know, improving value, quality and patient safety focus, population health, clinical guidelines, all things that we've talked about are real challenges that academic medical centers are looking at, are trying to do research on this. Um, the problem with academic medical centers, as you know, most of us train probably at an academic medical center. They're usually tertiary quaternary medical centers, right? The big universities. They don't, you know, they do episodic care. They're, they're not what most of your residents are going to go practice in, which is a community setting for the most part. Um, 
you know, that, that are not tertiary quaternary centers. As, as Sherry said, you know, who's the OMFS? Well, it's you, you know, but at an academic medical center, you've got every single subspecialty there that you just call somebody. What are your, you know, they're very bureaucratic. They are inefficient. Um, so academic medical centers are going to be especially challenged. Um, and how do we protect that academic mission? With, with the, um, the changes in the ACGME rules, how do we protect the academic mission is, is something that's going to be critical at the academic medical centers for training in the future. But they also have to move out of their tertiary quaternary mode. They have to start now setting up community rotations where most of their docs are going to be working at. A lot of, you know, academic medical centers are slow to do this. We also are seeing a change in the physician employment. And that affects our training in some ways. I mean, you know, in 2000, only, you know, 57% uh, were practicing independently. 30 years ago, it was about 80% were independent. You know, they had their own groups. But again, we're seeing, you know, the consolidation that's happening in medicine. We're down, actually by 2018, it's down to about 25%. Uh, and it's probably gonna get less and less. And, and that's, again, you know, the consolidation and mergers is something, you know, different than this topic, but it is to try to create efficiencies, um, you know, in, in uh, care and in cost, which may or may not happen, but um, this is truly what's happening. We've trained now two generations of, or three generations almost, of doctors that are, are going to become employed. Um, some of that's, you know, maybe not there, but it's just the way medicine's moving. So consumerism is also going to be a big part of, of how we deal with training in the future. I mean, consumers want many choices, digitally enabled, um, options with price, visible, uh, visibility through delivery of care, uh, service on demand, 24-7 access, digital telemedicine, extended hours of access. Um, this is, you know, the, as the millennials age, uh, it, you know, may not be my generation, but, you know, in future generations, this is what they're going to want. And so how do we train our doctors, how do we prepare for this is going to be important. And again, with population health, there's a, a, there's a continuum of care of which you see emergency medicine is towards the end of that, but we're not, you know, we're part of a continuum. So there's primary care, there's wellness programs, there's pharmacies. They come to the emergency department, then they have... Uh, post-acute care, uh, skilled nursing, end of life. It's a continuum. So doctors of the future are going to have to learn how to work within that continuum to help coordinate care. And again, there's a lot of different pillars of clinically integrated care. There's a collaboration or collaborative leadership. There's aligned incentives, which you know, are often financial. Uh, clinical programs such as disease management, care protocols, clinical metrics population health, we're going to have to fit into that pillar in emergency medicine. And then technology and infrastructure. Again, I think we're, going to, we're, we're just in the infancy in a lot of this stuff, but I think technology of the future is, will eventually hopefully support our practice, but we're going to have to be much more savvy in terms of our technology and the use of it. So again, the training metrics have moved, as I said, to a competency-based. I think utilization is going to become much more important. Cost, quality, patient experience. How many of your, you know, I know no residency program in the country is, is giving their residents all of these. They may look at some utilization. They may report what cases they're doing. They might even, you know, how many patients they're seeing per, per day or per shift. But we're not reporting this. But yet, when they get out, they will get reported on this. So we're, you know, you know, with, uh, in my role as, as the executive vice president at USACS over the academic programs, we're looking at ways to create a resident portal where we can report this to the residents so they can look up what their CT utilization was or what, you know, what their RVUs per hour they're generating. Uh, you know, if, if we can try to get down to quality and patient experience, it's not easy even at a large company that has all its data to pull this out for residents. But we probably should be giving this because they're going to get measured on this as, as uh, when they get out and become practicing physicians. 
So we need to start looking at how do we get this data to our residents' training. Um, so in implementation, implementation steps, looking uh, for funding in unconventional places. So partnering with community hospitals um, and other you know, health care uh, centers, federally qualified health centers, looking at different ways and opportunities for our res residents and our trainees to practice in areas where they're going to practice. Because an academic medical center, you know, maybe 20, 20 to 25 percent of your residents stay at an academic medical center. 75 percent go out and practice in the community. Integrating technology into medical education is going to be critical. I think we're starting to see this, you know, Medical students and residents of today are much more technolog technologically savvy than, than I was. Um, but uh, I think, th you know, the technology is going to keep expanding, and they've got to integrate that into medical education. Again, providing experiences beyond the hospital or clinical walls are going to be critical. And educating students on financial and regulatory aspects of medical practice is something that's going to have to happen in the future. It, we even as you know, are more experienced, are going to have to be educated on the financial and regulatory aspects of medical practice. I mean, how many of you really understand MIPS or APM right now? Well, you're getting paid for that. You know, I even give talks on it. I still don't understand it as fully as, you know, it's, it's complex. So we're going to have to, not only students, residents, but current practicing doctors are going to have to be educated on how our role is in a, a coordinated care system that is often risk-based. And the last thing I think we need to prepare oh, and implement train the trainer programs, but the last thing, and I'm not going to talk much about this, but is physician wellness. And, you know, Kevin gave a talk earlier this morning on uh, physician wellness, but there are really three domains. There's a culture of wellness, efficiency of practice, and personal resilience. And I think, you know, this is becoming a much more important area uh, in medicine is, is wellness. And I think, you know, we need to start this in medical school um, and certainly in, in residency, give more attention to, to wellness and developing uh, resiliency.